lot of people have asked me, what does that last song have to do with the blues? Because it's not a traditional, what people would consider right now, blues. And most people, when they think of blues, they think of um, the Stevie Ray Vaughan. They think of Eric Clapton. Or maybe some people who are pretty hip might think B.B. King or Robert Cray. And a lot of those guys are very famous for 12-bar blues. And 12-bar blues is a pretty standard format for what most people are writing. But I am so interested in blues and all of its many uh, decades because the blues is over 100 years old now. Just over 100, they trace its origins back to around 1904. Um, when a bunch of chicks that were on the vaudeville circuit got hip to Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith and their, uh, their type of blues. And that was not at all in the 12-bar form. That was called classic blues, the classic blues period. And this period went from the early part of the last century through 1929, 1930, when they thought, oh my goodness, people aren't buying blues records anymore. It must be the women's fault. I mean, excuse me, there was a freaking crash in the economy. That was like the one we just had in 2008. Okay, <laughs> but uh, because of that happening, then the Vogue went from women's blues um, to guitar players and the focus came down here to the Delta. So I write in all the various genres of blues from the classic blues period. I have uh, a song on my very first CD called I'm So Blue Because Both of My Men Are Gone. This is typical of what a classic blues singer would sing about. A classic blues singer would come out in her best clothes. She would be dressed like she was going to a ball. She would have her gold teeth displayed. She'd be wearing gold jewelry. If she had gold coins, they would be put, pierced through and put on a necklace. That's why when it's showtime, it's showtime. You don't get up on a stage dressed in some crappy old overalls or broke down jeans. You get up in your finery and you try to be a representation of the best of what you can be. To be a role model and to inspire the people who are there listening to you. Then you're always going to be telling a couple of jokes. If you're a classic blues singer, you're going to talk about like for example, Bessie Smith had a song called I Want a Pig Foot and a Bottle of Beer. Well, a pig foot back in the 1920s was not a piece of something to eat. Well, it was. <laughs> it was slang for a young man. It meant, I want, I'm like, she was a cougar. Let's get over it, okay? And she wanted a pig foot and a bottle of beer so she could enjoy her Saturday night right, you know? So in that tradition, I always like to do that. I always crack jokes and I tell stories with my songs that will entertain people and make people smile. In my opinion, life is hard enough. You don't need to go someplace and have somebody make you feel bad. You need to go there and exercise whatever demons have been hounding you that week and get them out. And get them out in a way that's not going to be socially destructive. You want to get that out in where you can be dancing your natural butt off where you can just shake it with the person you came with or maybe meet a new person there and really enjoy yourself and go away feeling released and relieved. And uh, I think this is so important in a time when we've kind of lost our way as a culture and we don't really have these kind of outlets and we see things like the uh, Sandy Hook tragedy. If people were listening to the blues and getting down at the juke joint on a Saturday night, they would not be feeling like going and shooting their classmates. That's just one woman's opinion, and I apologize if I offend anyone. But also, the blues is meant to tell the news. It's meant to talk about what people are thinking about the politics of the day. Now, I've written a couple of songs about, uh, about um, the government, particularly on my latest record, Clarksdale, I wrote a song called The 420 Blues, because I object to our tax dollars being spent on a war we can't win, and I'm talking about the drug war. And I think that we need to be spending money on infrastructure and on our schools and on enriching our culture and in letting people know that America is the best. We have the best, the brightest people come here because we still are the land of milk and honey for people all over the world. And we need to stop putting on TV the stupidest, the dumbest, the worst, the, you know, forget that. We are the cream and we need to express that. So I'm a very opinionated woman, as you can tell, and uh, I like to express in my songs that uh, you need to be proud, you need to look to the best things that you've been able to accomplish. Remember that about yourself. Yeah, bad things happen, but that only lasts a little while, and then you go, go through that. 
You may, and the blues is not about just being sad. It's not your grandfather's music, it's everybody's music. It's about every emotion that you can have. It's about being rich, it's about being broke. It's about being happy, it's about being horny. It's about being sad, it's about not knowing what you're feeling, but something's going on. <laughs> so, uh, in my travels through the history of the blues, where I've been trying to learn about this so that I can be a proselytizer for the blues, I have studied a lot of uh, what, what you might call classic blues. I've studied this Delta blues. I really love the music of uh, Mississippi John Hurt, uh, Miss, uh, Sam McLean. Uh, I, I love to listen to these old cats that are down here playing. There's a cat here in T-Model 4, he's 92 years old. He's not doing very well right now. We hope that he will be blessed with more life. But these are, these are people that have a lot to say I'm sorry that in this culture we devalue anybody over the age of whatever they've decided it is now that you can be, but older people are fascinating. They are full of stories they want to share. Nobody's asking them. Nobody's interested. They don't get to be on TV, and so they lose their mind. They get dementia. They get Alzheimer's because they want to think about back when they were valued and loved and wanted. So I really, that's my opinion about what happened, that why there is all this experience of Alzheimer's and dementia. And uh, must, some people might say, well, that's because they have too many chemicals and they were drinking diet sodas. No, it's because nobody is sitting down saying, hey, tell me about when you stormed the beach in Normandy. Tell me about when you met grandma. Tell me your story. And they want to tell it. They want you to know, and there's so much richness in those stories. Now me, I know I, I'm not exactly what you expect when you see a blues person. You know, people have said to me, oh, well, uh, we, we expected you to be bigger. And I know that they meant other things when they said that word, but it is not the traditional thing to be a freckle-faced, red-headed person of diminutive stature in the blues. Well, I am nothing if not patient. And I plan to keep living until I'm accepted and until, uh, like, you know, there's a lot of fights going around in the world right now for people to be accepted for who and what they are. Yes, that's my fight. Well, Clarksdale is this amazing, there's on the map a triangle, a magical triangle. And it's from uh, Memphis, Helena, Arkansas, Clarksdale, and the environs. Those are the point, compass points of this triangle. And so many amazingly talented people have come from this era, from this area, and have added to our cultural diaspora as Americans. They have come from this area and they have influenced the music of the entire world. There is nothing that you hear anywhere uh, except for possibly classical music because that's from Europe and uh, I can't think of any other kind of music that's not influenced by the blues, including bluegrass, including country music. Because the people who are making that music were growing up right next door, literally, to the people making blues. Um, people who were playing banjos and people who were playing violins lived on the same plantation and traded with each other. Now my history of going back to uh, study the blues history brought me to Clarksdale. I think that that passion that I have for where did this come from and how do I fit into it was what ultimately led me here. Now I have a friend, Lon Michelson from Minnesota. He's the guy who told me about Clarksdale and brought me down here the first time. And for me it was very, very difficult to get accepted on the Chicago blues scene. I've been playing blues based out of Chicago for 30 years and I've had to fight tooth and nail to be a part of that scene just because when I started when I came to Chicago in 1979 you could go to a club and see Coco Taylor, Lonnie Brooks, Son Seals, Lefty Diz, Muddy Waters I mean these folks were still playing clubs. Muddy Waters passed away shortly after I moved to Chicago and unfortunately I only got a chance to see him one time or I might be have married him too <laughs> but uh, but his music influenced me so much. It was people like, when I was a kid, I was listening to Lightning Hopkins and, uh, and uh, Lightning Hopkins, Lead Belly. At the same time, I was listening to Johnny Cash and Hank Williams. 
And that music all comes from down around this area. But when you go and you look at the people that are the regular people, they name the rooms at the Riverside Hotel. At that was Muddy Waters. He came from a plantation not far from here. That was the Howlin' Wolf. He also came from this area. That was Ike Turner, who was from Memphis. He wrote the uh, Rocket 88, the song Rocket 88, in a room at the Riverside Hotel and invented rock and roll music. This is like right here in this town. And you can come here and walk around and people say, Hi, I'm so-and-so. Nice to meet you. And hey, can I play with you? Would you like to play with me? I had a friend of mine from Nashville called me up on the phone this afternoon and he goes, hey Liz, I'm gonna be down there uh, playing at the new Roxy. Will you bring your washboard over and play with me? That doesn't happen in Chicago. People don't invite you. They don't tell you about new clubs. They don't want you on their show. They wanna keep what they got for them. <laughs> I've had people try to get me fired off jobs because they were jealous that I was there. And that maybe I'm maybe I'm not so bad looking, you know. So uh, you know, there's a lot of competition, but down here there's this warmth, and you feel it. And people come here, like the guy who owns this museum, Tao D. He has been in love with American roots music all his life. He's from Holland. Another guy that uh, I had major surgery in 2010 and I was flat out and I thought well I don't even know if I'm going to come back and be a blues singer anymore it's so much work and so little reward and I'm so not loved I just felt really bad about it and I was married and my husband said well honey you don't have to be anything except what you want you can stay home and cook and you know just be beautiful dress your dresses and do your hair and go with your girlfriends and and a friend from Holland who plays slide guitar is a real Delta guy. He actually uh, was in the finals at the International Blues Challenge this year, my friend Peter Stroik. And Peter came to Chicago and he said, so Liz, what music have you written? What, what are you written lately? Come on, get your guitar. Come on, let's play. He said, I got my guitar. Here, let's play. And he got his slide out and he's like, and I said, no, really, I haven't written anything. I've just been sitting around trying to get well and stuff. And, and he's like, no, no, I know you wrote stuff. You write stuff all the time. Come on, show me what you wrote. I was like, well, I wrote this silly little song called Sweet Potato Pie. And he goes, well, play it for me. So I played it, and it's a little ditty. And he goes, I like that. That's really different. You don't expect it to go to the five there. You expect it to go to the four. Come on, now, now I'm going to play it again. Now play it again. What else have you got? And it was because of my friends like this, friends from Europe and friends from Japan and friends from Canada and friends that I didn't even realize were out there missing me who would email me and say, hey Liz, when are you coming back to Florida? Hey Liz, when are you coming back to Washington DC? I'd be like, well, I don't know. Probably, maybe never, I don't know. And they go, come on, come on, get it back together. Get your band on, come on. And this was what got me up out of that bed and got me going again was this people get into the blues, they get so passionate about it that they need it. It's like a drug. And at first, when I first heard the blues, I didn't really get it. I said, oh, three chords, boring. Same stuff over and over. Where's the interesting modal changes? And where's the key change? And where's the, you know? When I got it, I was sitting down listening to a Jimmy Reed record. And I said, oh, I see. This one has a change here. Ooh, listen to this one. It goes do 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 instead of dum da dum da dum. And it's something clicked on in my head, and I have never been the same since. Mm -hmm. So I keep searching for more blues all the time, and I'm looking for ways to bring the blues to a new audience. And uh, one of the reasons why I was attracted to come down to Clarksdale, other than that my friend told me I had to come here and that when I got here I met Rat and I stayed at the Riverside Hotel and that I went to the Arkansas Blues and Heritage which is now called the Biscuit, the King Biscuit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there hanging around backstage and I was still not quite back. I was still just, I'd sing a little bit now and then but I wasn't trying to book myself any gigs or anything. And the famous DJ, Sonny Payne, who has been broadcasting the King Biscuit Hour for 50 years and he knows everybody. He knew Willie Big Eye Smith when Willie Big Eye Smith was just a teenager. He knows James Cotton to call him Jim. Mm -hmm. 
He knows everybody. Anson Funderburg comes in and says, hey, Sonny, how you doing? Oh, hey, Anson, I'm on the radio. Sit down, you know. And he came over and he said, somebody said, oh, you know what? Sonny wants to meet you. I said, what? Sonny, the Sonny pay what? He knows who I am? And I went over and he goes, so, Red, when are you going to put out a new record? He said, I love that record, Red Top, you did. Oh, that's, oh, I love that. And it was that. It was that warmth and that welcome and that familial thing mm -hmm. that made me need to come back and need to make new records and need to write new songs. And I'm back and I feel 120% and I'm thrilled to be here. Hi, I'm Liz Mandeville. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, and I'm a blues woman. And this has been my Oxford session. <laughs>